I'd like to introduce the director of Nordo, Mr. Kyle Topkin. <laughs> Kyle has been making movies for many, many years, and um, you were awarded the 2019 Indie Memphis Hometown of uh, a short award too for Soul Man, right? Yes, that's right. So two-time, two-time winner. Um, cool. So I've got my notes on my phone, so just uh, bear with me a moment. But I think the first question is, well, actually, the first thing I want Kyle to do is, so I'm sure there are several people who haven't seen the movie yet. Um, if you could give us your, like, 20-second elevator pitch about what the movie is about. Yeah, for sure. First, thanks, y'all, for being here. It means a lot to me and everybody that worked on the film. Um, so I'm super excited to have the chance to do this. Uh, the film that I'm here to talk about and that you're going to see of mine tonight is called Nordo. And Nordo is um, a drama centered around a woman whose husband volunteers sort of unexpectedly to go fly troops and refugees uh, out of Afghanistan during the, the troop withdrawal that happened in 2021. Um, and our story sort of stays at home with her as she grapples with fear and anxiety and the unknown, uh, you know, in regards to his whereabouts, his safety, uh, when she essentially loses contact with him for several days uh, during that event while he's gone. That's a 20 seconds, but that's okay. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, so this is going to be hard for me to I know, it's going to be hard for me too, so we're, we're going to get through it though. Um, so I guess we'll just start from the development process. So when did you first have this idea and like, what made you think like this is a movie? So the film is very loosely based on uh, the real experiences of a close, uh, some close friends of, of my wife and I's, uh, who this happened to. He, uh, my friend, is a, 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 a pilot for FedEx, um, but is still a part of the Air National Guard here in Memphis. And he really did sort of last minute volunteer to go uh, over and, and assist with the withdrawal effort. Uh, and his wife um, was left home with their three kids, their three young kids. Um, and, you know, we weren't, we weren't quite sure for some time if he was okay, where he was, exactly what was going on, as the nature of, of that is. Uh, and so uh, once he did, did make it home um, and we went to eat dinner with them and began to talk to him about his experience and talk to his wife about her experience at home, you know, it just, it, it became uh, really exciting to me to think about trying to take that framework and that sort of foundation of, uh, of, of, of a real life story and explore some basic things like fear and anxiety, but also our relationships with our devices, our relationship to the news, um, these necessary things that we all have to interact with or engage with in some way or another in our lives um, but for her they hold you know life and death meeting um, and so it became an interesting challenge to go okay can I make that cinematic can I make that engaging and can I put viewers sort of in her shoes you know and, and, and take viewers through what her experience was like and were your friends pretty receptive to you wanting to explore this in a movie they were, you know, and I, I really have to give them all the credit for sort of being receptive to it. You know, they were involved in it from the very beginning. I, I do say it loosely, loosely based on them because the characters aren't really like them in a, a personal way. It was a jumping off point, but I still wanted their permission and their input uh, and, and uh my friend who, who the wife, the main character is based on, was a, a huge part of the process. She and I met to talk many times, the lead actress Lauren and, and her and I met to talk. Um, and so she, and, and many, many elements of the film itself came from things she told me in those conversations. So she had a huge impact on like sort of the direction of, of the narrative, or what there is of a narrative there. Um. So in the writing process, they were involved, but you also had a, a co-writer, correct? Or co so you have a story by credit, right, with your wife, Emily. What was that process like? Had you ever worked with her in a creative capacity before? Uh, yes, she's always 
a, a very crucial part of my process. Um, she's brilliant and studied literature um, and works in literacy and education now. And so she uh, she's always sort of the first the first pass person anyway that reads anything that I, I'm writing. I don't know. She always brings gravitas to it. She always asks me hard questions and she's like not a bullshitter in, in any <laughs> way, shape or form. Uh, and so and that's helpful for me um, to, to get real talk like that. So, so that's kind of one answer to that, which, which is how she's always been a part of, of this stuff. On this film in particular, you know, um, I'm not a mom, I'm not a wife, I'm not a woman. And so these are things that I need help with filling in the gaps of, of what that experience is like. So I invited dialogue from the, the woman that it's based on, from Lauren, lead actress, from Amanda, my production designer in front, and from my wife, Emily, you know, to really help me um, push this over the hump of cliche and stereotypes and things like that. that um, that might have been been there kind of in those first drafts of the script. But really working with Emily on this in particular uh, was around the end of the film, and she really helped me see the end in a really new and exciting way. Uh, and the end of the film would not be what it is without her, without her input. And so I felt she just needed more than kind of that silent uh, silent credit that she usually has. Right. Um, so did you do any other additional research about like deployment and about like how that the effects on those or how, how those affect spouses and families? Or was it just like you're trusting, this is more just a perspective of these one, like this family and it's based on your friends or was there more like research that you did in that regard? I, don't, I, I didn't do any outside research outside of my conversations with um, the, the couple. Uh, you know, I think in part because I was only really interested in, in their emotional reality while this was going on. Uh, and I, I trusted that some of those broader or larger truths maybe about military spouses or folks that are in the military and, and do these sorts of things. You know, I, I trusted that those would, would come out if I got the emotional, like, tenor right. And, um, and so I, I really centered my research around conversations with, with the two of them um, and with her in particular. Let's talk a little bit about the writing process itself. So when you're writing something like this, like, what, especially, I don't know if you've ever made anything really before that's based on uh, you know, people, people's experience of people that you're close with. Are you going through drafts, multiple drafts, and like refining it, having them look at it? Or are you giving it out to other people? Or are you just like, you know, um, you, you fire it out in a weekend and you roll with what you've um, written, like what's your, what's your overall writing process there? Uh, it, my writing process is tormented and, and <laughs> um, but it's special too. It's a special moment in the process where you know, this, this thing that's only in your heart and soul and mind kind of begins to become real as words on the page. I, I tend to, I tend to stew on things and think about things and have conversations and dream a bit, um, for a while before I ever sit down and write. And then the writing kind of, the writing happens when I feel so, so kind of full of all of that dreaming and, and um, ideation that I, I'm afraid I'm gonna like forget something. So I'm, uh, I'm like, I gotta write this down. So it, it, it's it's actually a little closer probably than like the vomit draft method. Um, and then yes, there's like uh, a circle of folks that kind of I always send my stuff to because including like, like my wife, you know, I know they're gonna give me like real talk feedback. And I, I always listen to that stuff. I, I can't imagine not, uh, yeah, not taking in thoughts like that. Um, so 
Let's talk about the producing side of it. When you're in development, um, I think you only have yourself credited as a producer in this. Did you have any other like fundraising attempts? Did you have anyone else handling like early logistic stuff for you, or was it just you know what you're doing and you kind of just run those on your own? Uh, yeah, I, this one in particular, um, the logistics of it were not too challenging. I mean, it's outside of one kind of brief scene at the beginning, towards the beginning, it's all in one location. Um, so that's helpful. And, um, the, the house we shot at is their house and they were out of town. And, and so we had to kind of wedge it in. Um, but I, I really wanted to try to infuse it with as much of their reality as I could, because I knew that there would be some truths that would ring out from that. Did you always know you'd be shooting in their house? And so that kind of wrote around the location. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was always my, my goal and they were down for that. I mean, these are some of our closest friends and they were very generous to let me do that and to let me kind of mine their real terrifying life experience for like a, a narrative short for sure. But I, I, I really felt that without shooting at their house, um, using some of her wardrobe pieces, um, some all the production design in the film as it is, is like 99.9% .9 items in the home. I think Amanda might've brought a few things in, but um, infusing it with their reality, uh, I felt was really important. So from a producing aspect, in a really, and, and our cast and crew was like tiny. I think we had like four people on the crew, maybe five at times and you know, as you'll see, the cast is really just Lauren, except for a couple of scenes. So it was really just like ordering lunch and making sure everybody knew when to be there. Well, is that an intentional for this type of story that you wanted a small crew or is that just how you naturally work? Cause I feel like it comes through the, like you want to create a sense of like, you know, you're living with this person, you're like holding on to those like small moments. And you know, sometimes you don't want a big crew around. You want a much smaller, more intimate crew. Is that by design or was that a necessity? I would say it's first a necessity because it's all I can afford. Um, uh, and I, I do, there is something, I mean, the, the, the kind of summer camp aspect of making films, I think is what is, is so totally special about it as a medium and a process. Um, and to really do that with a very tight knit group is super special and, and meaningful. And I think, I think the vibe and the energy of what that feels like it is infused into the work too. And um, so I don't know, I, I've never had an opportunity to work with like a big crew. Yeah. So I'll, I'd be curious to to do that someday, but. And it's more than a curiosity. Like you really want to work with the patient. <laughs> <laughs> As we all do. Um, well, you know, we were, we're talking about crew. So I know you had a small crew, but um, Let's talk about the, the the folks you did work with. So you have a talented production designer and talented. Um, uh, uh, you guess you were the cinematographer, but you had some additional visual support there. Um, talk about that a little bit and tell us like why the individuals you chose were right for this project. What your process is when it comes to you know bringing in the right crew. Yeah, I think for for me and and what what I've done so far as a filmmaker. Um, vibes are very important and i it, what you can, with, with ca casting sort of different but sort of the same it's like if if the energy and the vibe is right with people i'm, I'm sort of more concerned with that feeling right and with them being like the most experienced person in, in this or that uh role uh -huh. on the crew and you know part of it too is who's down to do it this way, you know? And I feel fortunate that I've been able to become a part of the film community in Memphis and meet a lot of filmmakers and crew members and actors in town. And that so far, whenever I make a short, I kind of have in mind who I would like to be doing what, and usually they want to do it. And I feel really lucky that people want to like work on it and so um for the for this film in, in particular i didn't have a traditional 
cinematographer. I sort of was the cinematographer, but I don't even really like to say that because really it was Sam Leathers and I working uh, very closely together to get the visuals uh, right on this one. And he saw he was like a gaffer and a, and a first AC, but, um, you know, a lot of the lighting is his doing. Um, so Sam, here you are, aren't you? I saw you, Sam. Sam, come up here, Sam. Come say hi to us. But with, but with Sam in particular, like, uh, Josh Cannon and I are really close friends and Josh and Sam are like, you know, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, uh, running around Memphis making everything you can imagine. And so I had worked on some stuff of Josh's, you know, and Sam and I got to know each other and Sam's like insanely talented. And, and I just thought it'd be really exciting to see what, what he would bring to, <laughs> um, here, you can sit here. Well, I was going to, no. um, I wanted to ask Sam, uh, was there something specific about this project that you wanted to work on or was it an opportunity to work with Kyle? Like, um, and also I know you were also a cinematographer, so, you know, you coming on board and not necessarily being the DP, but still having visual input. What was that like for you? It was fun. Um, I'm a good friend of Kyle's. I admire his work and think he's talented. Uh, he, but I think he probably recruited me because I've worked at LensRails for a long time, apart from working with each other. I just, I came on sort of more on a technical side. And then once we started talking about it, it became more of an interlinked kind of talking about each shot together, talking about what cameras we wanted to use and why, and just, you know, kind of what I think I brought to this a little bit. Um, but, you know, Kyle came up with all this, this is his movie. I just kind of helped him warn what he wanted to make. And it was really fun. I just had a, a blast doing it. Were you part of the shot listing? No, no. The, the fact that I just, I just worked on cameras all day. Yeah, what Sam is I always brought him on because he works with... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you knew the truth. Come on. Now, was, um, were you part of like the shot listing process at all? Were you part of like, um, like what was your creative input in the film? Well, we talked uh, shot lists, but we more so talked about lens choice and kind of camera movement and even like camera sensor sizes, debating to shoot on either his camera or a certain kind of camera. And then we decided on full frame might be a little better because we're filming in interiors the whole time. And it's a little bit of a bigger, deeper image. You feel like you can step into it a little more, kind of like you're within the interiors with the characters a little more. Um, so that was a fun revelation, but, um, I don't know, I feel like Kyle kind of handled most of the shot lists and I came on more as a uh, kind of AC visual consultant, um, but I had a blast doing it. Um, I had a really good time and I think it turned out really well. Awesome. Well, thanks, Sam. Thanks for coming up here and hanging with us for a minute. Sure. Yeah. Sam's tremendous. He's shooting a lot of things all over town and is one of the best like rising cinematographers in the city. So thank you, Sam, for coming up and chatting with us. Yeah, like a lot of Sam's work is is um, really striking, and he, I don't know quite how he does it, except like sort of saw how he does it on this film. His 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 nighttime and and darkly lit work is just fantastic, and it's so hard to do. And I knew that we wanted to do something a little more moody here, and we were going to be inside, and so it's like a natural. Awesome. Um, we're going to start the movie in just a minute, but before we do that, I wanted to ask about the casting process. You don't have a lot of actors in the film, but you do have some, uh, some, some recognizable Memphis, uh, talent in here. Can you talk a little bit about adding Lauren, having McTeer, having that whole awesome cast that you had with a, like, did you know those are the people you wanted from the beginning or was it a, did you go through a rehearsal process or I'm sorry, a, a audition process? What was that casting process like? Um, one of my favorite parts of the process is dreaming about who can inhabit what part can go with their casting. And usually, uh, I have somebody in mind that I've seen and something local or that I feel like might, you know, be into it. Um, sometimes they've done like a lot of local stuff. Sometimes they might have three lines and somebody short or whatever. Um, and so for this, it was just kind of the same process I've done for a lot of my shorts, uh, where I just kind of handpick people as I see them in things. 
Lauren is somebody who, uh, she made a short film while she was pregnant about being homeless. And in that film, I was just, I was really moved by her performance. Um, and, and I thought she was kind of, and I, and she's sort of more classically trained as an actor. And I just thought, I thought, I thought she kind of had a lot going on and there would be a lot to work with there. Um, and so she just fit the bill like beyond perfectly for this part specifically. And I'd wanted to use her for something. And so when I knew I was going to be making something about these characters, these types of peoples, these types of people that she could fit the bill of, you know, that was like a no-brainer. McTeer was somebody I saw in your short film, Returns. Um, and I've like sort of thought about him forever. And uh, he was so good in that. And so um, he had just moved to Knoxville too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had just left Memphis, but he came back to do it. And it's really, unfortunately, not a lot for him to do. Um, so he was very generous to come, come back to Memphis right after having left and, and do it. Well, I mean, we'll see in just a minute, but did you, as far as like their chemistry and their dynamic and all that, like, did you have them spend much time together? Did, was it just like, because of the nature of just, you know, a low budget and you know, shooting over a couple of days, was it just get them on set and let's roll? Or did you give them opportunity to like, you know, try to build something? to build a rapport with each other? Um, I left that up to them, you know, and I, that's part, part of my way of working with actors is to really defer to their preferences and their process if they have a specific way that they like to do things like that. Um, and so I, I asked both of them what they would like to do, and McTeer said, I want Lauren to decide because this is really her movie, and I want her to have the support she needs. And so she said, you know, I think it'd be good if we have a brief conversation sort of the first day on set, but I don't want to spend a lot of time with them because I want to be able to feel the distance and kind of the cold nature of their dynamic, at least in this, you know, slice of their life. And so they really didn't communicate a ton, but I, I think it helped. Well, I think on that note, I think we can know if we're ready to, we can bring up the movie and start it up and then we'll kind of continue the conversation a little bit afterwards. So it's about 11 minutes long. So uh, everybody buckle in and enjoy. <laughs> Let's give it up one more time for Kyle and Marty. Amanda Montgomery uh, was a production designer and she did incredible work. And um, I think it's helpful for you all to hear from her for just a moment now that you've seen the film. And I would love to have her just tell you about uh, her, her, her thought process and the way she approached this work and working with a real space and real items because I think especially for filmmakers in the room, that maybe want to do things like this, kind of one or two locations locally, you know, you're going to be shooting in real places with real people's stuff. Maybe you're finding stuff at, at Goodwill or thrift stores or whatever to populate the world that you're creating. And I think it might be helpful to hear from Amanda about how she did that on this film. Before she says anything, I'll also say this was the first film she's ever worked on. Um, so. Yeah, Kyle um, was very kind to let me um, practice and just be brave and try something completely new and different. And it was a, really a ton of fun. Um, we talked a lot about Lauren's character and digging deep into the nuances. And then um, I think we really wanted to push past the, okay, so she's really put together in the beginning and then she dis she's disheveled at the end. You know, she's totally stressed out. And I really wanted to take it to a place where physically Lauren on the outside, her character is the type of person that actually plays it off like she's put together most all of the time, even when she's really stressed out. Um, and we all know people like that. Um, and so really wanted to keep her wardrobe pretty tight throughout the um, entire film. Um, and you'll see like even toward the end where, you know, the most stressful scene, her in her robe, it's still a really nice robe, a matching set, but her hair is just a little more disheveled than it was, you know, at the beginning. Um, in general, she's a really put together person. Her home is very put together. Uh, but I also wanted to recognize the fact that she's a mom and she has this tension of children, toddlers at home. And so we talked about the idea, you know, 
even when Lauren sits down, like she has to physically move a toy out of her way and just the, the mental load and the capacity of being a mom um, paired with her physical surroundings, the clutter, the kids' toys, you know, um, and yet they, she's still trying to hold it together. So everything still looks pretty good, I would say, um, for someone who is in such a stressful situation. Um, but yeah, it was super fun. We played a lot with um, on set with the couples, their home, um, what was there. We tried to add in a little piece of like um, flying in every scene. So whether that be through an airplane toy in the scenes where there's close-ups, Lauren has a necklace that has birds on it. Um, so there's always, I think, this reminder of her husband being gone. And I wanted to subtly, like very subtly, just remind the audience that he's not there, but that she's still holding on to him in some way. The family is still reminded of his presence uh, through their physical kind of atmosphere. So super fun. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, Amanda. It takes a village, you know? Everybody has their input, everybody has their creative say in the final film. Um, you know, watching that again, here's the fourth time I've seen it now. Um, one of the things that stood out to me in this watch was the sound, the sound design, and the score, or lack of score, but you're using um, uh, the, 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 the and it's initially non diegetic is that the right term? Yeah. Um, where it's the, the sound of the, 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 the child banging on the, on the piano, and then it's like reincorporated and getting louder and getting more like yeah, throughout the film, like it's kind of adding to that anxiety and stress. Do you talk a little about that process? Because it works really well and it also runs the risk of becoming like, and, and I know it's intentional, it's supposed to be like, ah, uh, grating on you. Is that fixed experience she's having. So yeah, I guess just talk a little bit about that a little bit. Yeah, well, the really cool thing about that for me is that the piano stuff and the whole that whole scene and setup came from a conversation with my friend, uh, as we were just talking about the things that, that just grate on her, uh, that her kids do. And one of the things was they sit there and bang on that piano. Uh, and you know, that was sort of a light bulb moment when she told me that one of our conversations where I thought, you know, that's, that's so perfect and so real, something I would have never thought of. Um, and so I've got to figure out a way to incorporate that. So I, I knew that that bang kid banging on a piano thing was going to be a, a tension point, you know, and, and a scene in the film, um, and a, and a way to show her starting to maybe lose her grip a little bit, um, in, in a subtle way. Uh, and then it became clear just in post really that, 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 that piano track needed to kind of come back in in those moments that it does. But then, you know, I also played with reversing it, slowing it down, speeding it up, morphing it. Um, you know, so there's multiple layers. It's all the same, you know, pieces of the same track, just sort of mixed up and messed up and piled on top of each other. And the phone sounds too were really important to me that, um, it was so funny about this that I never would have thought of. I don't know if you all felt this way, but people have, talked about how annoying the phone is, you know, the sounds of the phone. It's something like we all get annoyed by, but we all have it in our life. Um, and I knew I wanted the phone sounds to be a point of tension, but I didn't know how annoying that would be, um, which is kind of perfect. Well, that, that was my next question really was like, it's, it is annoying. It's annoying throughout the movie hearing that dinging and like, and it's always for her in a, a moment of anxiety and a little stress when she hears it. And then the final aid at the end, we hear it again, but it doesn't feel menacing. We know that it's a positive sound. And so it's, it's a, a fascinating choice, a great choice to be able to like build it up throughout the entire movie. That dinging is bad news. And then finally at the end, that ding, it sounds different almost, you know? Like if it doesn't like register in the same way that it's this like obnoxious sound. I thought that was, yeah, really, really extremely well done. I think that's cool. Um, so, you know, it's an old saying that like the film that you write and the film that you shoot and the film that you edit and is finished are always three different things, right? Did you feel that way making this? That you feel like the script you wrote and the film that you shot and then the film that we just watched, do they feel different? Or do you feel like it all kind of like really came together the way you wanted it to from the day you started writing to the day we screened it?
Th this one is different for me uh, because this is what I really wanted it to be. And that's sort of a cool new experience to have with the piece uh, for me at this point. Um, there are certainly differences in the script um, and then in what we shot and then what was edited. So it's definitely true and it's just always true. Um, but they don't feel like drastically different things uh, in my memory. I mean, things like the scene of her watching the plane take off was originally going to be the very first scene of the film. And it was supposed to be her sitting in the car looking out the windshield. You know, you change that because you, you're like, well, that actually doesn't work. How are you going to do that? You know, and stuff like that. But overall, the, the kind of the larger um, pieces of the film, like the tone and the structure, kind of the flashbacks being a part of it, um, that was all there in the script. Uh, I would say shooting, um, what what became really apparent while we were filming it, and this was some Sam and I talked a lot about, and something I really did bring to it intentionally, but that sort of came to the fore on set was just those long takes, setting up beautiful wide shots. You know, Sam mentioned the full frame camera we use, uh, the C500. You know, we originally talked about shooting this on anamorphic. I just really liked the idea of marrying an epic image with such an interior story. Um, but we cl quickly threw in a work out the window and instead opted for full frame, which still gives us that epic canvas. Um, it almost makes the house feel larger than life. And her and those close-ups, her face is just so big. Um, and I liked kind of uh, playing with, uh, playing with like the scale of that with such a intimate, intimate story. And, and those things became clear in the shooting that maybe they weren't really there like in the script per se. Cool. Um, I want to ask about editing a little bit, but I don't want to, we, we don't need to harp on for too long, but you've edited this yourself, right? And you edit most of your projects, correct? Do you have anyone else that gives you like specific editing, like tips or editing, not tips, I guess, but like insight into the movie? Because as a writer and the director and the editor, I mean, you're, it, it is one, it is your story. I mean, it's, you're telling someone else's story in a way, but it's yours. And did you ever at any point like feel you needed someone else's eyes on this in the, like a, in a very hands-on editing creative way? Or are you just, that's just, I know that's how you work, but you know, for this particular project, how did you feel? Sort of like with, with writing, um, I send cuts, like my friends are, they get so sick of me because I'm sending them cuts like nonstop, you know? So I definitely ask for feedback uh, when I'm editing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I can say that I, would recommend editing your own stuff. I kind of would love to work with an editor. This has just been the way I've been doing it for so long. It's it's just at this point really hard for me to imagine not doing it. That being said, I am not, I mean, I do believe in Kill Your Darlings. I do believe in um, getting things tight. This is obviously a little more slow uh, and that's on purpose, um, you know, but I, I definitely, send it out for feedback, welcome feedback, and really, really listen to that feedback. And then sitting and watching it with people is massively helpful, um, for sure. Um, well, we're gonna wrap up in just a second and hand it over to uh, Kayla and Lauren, but I do wanna ask about uh, your distribution process and what your plan is for getting it out into the world beyond just like the Memphis scene, because we screened it at Indie Memphis this past year. You won uh, Best Hometown Narrative Short, and uh, now what's next for the movie? Have you gotten it into other film festivals? Are you planning to try some other like creative ways of getting the movie out in the world or sticking with the festivals? Dude, I've been getting rejected from everybody. It's just how it goes. It feels, just, um, novice filmmakers, it's just the way it is. It's hard to get into festivals, yeah. but. Yeah, um, no, I, I, I'm doing the festival thing again. And the irony is I told myself that I wasn't going to do the festival thing with this. This really was born of a desire to grab a camera and just go make something with like three or four people in a weekend. And I was just going to put it online. And then I was like, dang, I kind of like it. And I was if I do the film festival. <laughs> so I, I, I think I have um, a film festival called South Georgia Film Festival in Valdosta. Georgia, uh, which I'm an alumni of, um, a guy, a professor there runs it, a uh, super nice guy, a really cool regional festival. Other than that, you know, I'm waiting on, um, the next success that's Adam. 
Well, cool, man. Well, I, I, I believe in the movie. I hope you get into more festivals. Um, Kyle's also been working on, oh, don't mind me saying, he's been working on trying to get a feature film going for quite a while now. And so that's extremely hard and extremely tricky. And Kyle's been doing a great job getting that prepped and ready to go. So hopefully that's uh, something that we'll be looking forward to in the future. So let's give it up for Kyle. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Seriously. Thank you.